Every single study is showing that less and less students are taking arts subjects each year. And for the past 40 years, they have also been hit with a different form of funding cut year on year. Cuts to art organisations in the UK. The City Council has cut arts funding for many from April. Dozens of job cuts and course cancellations. And maybe that's OK. Or maybe me saying that just made you bristle. Now, you've probably clicked on this video because you have some passion for the arts. So bear with me as I'm not going to make an argument in defence of dedicated art subjects. In fact, all the pro-arts education arguments I hear infuriate me. They often sound wonderful, but they are not cohesive, tangible reasons for why we should even attempt to reverse this trend. How much taxpayers' money should really be spent on the arts? My argument would be that in fact the state should not be supporting the arts directly at all. To the fury of many of my peers, I actually agree that many of these cuts are justified. You can't deny the fall off in uptake or the employment difficulties that many arts graduates have. What I'm going to do is try to unpack and understand why this fall off has happened and even go so far as to argue that to save the creative industries and even for them to thrive, you could cut dedicated art subjects completely. But you'll have to come with me on this ride as it's a really odd argument and, and framing it right means I need to thread this thought very carefully through the eye of two needles as to not lose either camp to relook at how we teach these subjects and the skills accrued and how they can thread back into culture and precisely articulate what comes unstitched in society when you don't do that and firstly i think you need to understand the surface level landscape of the battle actually when it comes to valuing arts education so fundamentally drama music and fine art you tend to have three camps. Firstly, you have those who vehemently defend it. They advocate about the intangible benefits of art, its proven effect on the culture, its cohesion, a tool for self-actualization and a tool for understanding the world and see these cuts as catastrophic. They say art is essential for a holistic education and especially vital for those doubtlessly brilliant minds who struggle with traditional education. And then there's the second camp which is those who recognize some form of intangible benefit but consider it a soft subject at school. They might well support and enjoy the arts, go to shows and plays, love film and concerts. They might even play the guitar and enjoy watercolor painting in their spare time. But if harder up, they might not naturally encourage their children to study the arts as they simply don't see it as having a clear employment benefit. It's fun, but not serious. They are ambivalent about the dropping rates and the cuts. Then there's this final camp, this third camp, who think that there is a complete oversaturation of useless arts degrees and see state-funded education as fundamental preparation for a younger generation to become economically viable in the workforce where the arts simply don't deliver. And this group, again, don't necessarily hate the arts at all. They may even actually engage with them, but that in a time of cuts and public money shortages, it's fair to reallocate resources to STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as these graduates simply have more opportunities and better jobs. Now, on the surface, I think it's actually pretty hard to argue with any of those three camps. It's, you feel like they're all serving aces at each other, but they're just playing on different courts with a misunderstanding of creativity in the first place. And that's what I want to go over in this video. So where do I come at all this? Well, I'm an artist. I love art. I live and I breathe it. I paint, I draw, I teach, I preach the benefits of art whenever I can. But I also didn't study art. I studied engineering for my degree. And over the years, I've developed what is a pretty unique view and why the arts are seemingly failing and why that might be okay. Now, don't get me wrong, the last thing I want to see is less artists and the stemming of creative minds yet to blossom in the education system. But you can only defend the arts education system so far on any level before you have to put your hands up and just say, it isn't working. Now I'll talk about where I am here in the UK 
Europe is slightly different and America over the pond is more so where secondary schools either do the arts brilliantly or terribly. I think it's 12% of American secondary schools they don't have a single art subject on the curriculum. But here in the UK, they do remain, but on the national curriculum, they are slowly getting thinned out. Over the last few years, there have been arts grants worth over 35 million cut in half. Last year, the Arts Council trimmed over 50 million from London, and just recently, the Ed Education Secretary here decided to freeze grants for music, drama, fashion, and tons of other art courses for, post for undergraduates and cut them completely for postgraduates. The response from all my peers was nearly unanimously the same. They shared the same article. And it led with this seemingly mind-blowing stat that the creative industries delivers over 115 billion in value to the UK and creates jobs at three times the UK average. Now that seems like a lot. And it kind of signifies to me that if you go and do a creative arts degree, you're three times more likely to get employed. There's a huge hidden irony <laughs> that those denouncing the cuts and using this figure in their defense don't quite see. And I really think that many of my fine artist, musician and actor friends wouldn't be branding these figures around if they understood where they actually came from. In this country, the creative industries comprises of nine subsectors. These range from advertising, architecture, fashion, film, publishing, galleries, etc. And there's an obvious spanner in the works in that not all of these subsectors bring in equal amounts. I think it's pretty obvious that one brings in a lot more than the others, and that's film, TV, and radio, which makes sense. And it does at just over 20 billion. That's more than fashion, craft, music and performing and visual arts, museums and galleries combined. But another one of those brings in way in over double of what even the film and TV category brings in. And that is IT, software and computer services with over 55 billion. Just let that sink in for a minute. Now, when you think of the stereotypical person working in these fields and an art student, I think you'd be lying if you said there wasn't some disconnect. I want to be clear. They deserve to be there. This category is the most bustling area of creativity that is also the wildly most economically viable. And it comprises of incredibly talented games designers mainly. People really underestimate the value and size of the gaming market. It also includes a generation of growing production tools using AI and new approaches to visual effects and the creation of collaboration tools used in production. Now, how many of these programmers do you think did a performance arts degree? And yet, the storytelling, the world building, the character design in complex modern games has more creativity and depth than most people who don't work in the sector realise. And of course, it needs concept artists and visually creative people to build those worlds, right? That's why it's in the creative industries, surely. Well, let's go onto the UCAS website and see what it says I should study if I want to train as a games designer and get a degree in it in this country. Maths, computing, physics and IT. So forgive me if I find it slightly disingenuous for people who are trying to defend performing arts cuts using this figure, 115 billion, to justify the value of the creative industries when their sector is one of the weakest contributors and the very people keeping it afloat didn't study a dedicated arts subject. And yet, I do feel a deep, deep sympathy for all the arts institutions and bodies that are being forced to shut up shop. I understand why they cling on to headlines like this, even though I think it's in error. The language of money, of economic benefit, 
is how they are forced to talk. But money talk is simply not native to the voices that produce great art. The value of Shakespeare, the beauty of Bach, the deeply personal reaction you have to your favourite painting is a medium that I truly believe is personally and collectively unmeasurable with money. And that, that's not to say you should waste endless money on it, no. Just at the value of something like your family, when you try to do it with money, it's just an ugh, horrible alien currency as a reference point. Art helps us explore and understand each other, ourselves, love, loss. It transcends time and cultures and identities. It articulates emotions beyond words. They guide us, soothe us, emotionally support us. And you know this, especially if you've ever knocked against a hard corner in life and found an artist, an author, or a playwright, or a poet who has made you deeply resonate with them. They made you laugh, they made you cry, and they made you feel reconnected. There is a monetary value, and we are talking about state funding here, so forgive me, but don't get me wrong. There is also a deep personal value, a cultural value, a value in people and place and ideas that is often way more powerful. I do understand that. The value of a thriving artistic hub is not something that leads with headlines in pounds or dollar signs, even though many investors think it might. It's just not primary. It follows. Just look at the standard classic process of gentrification in any city area. Young people move into a dilapidated area, a commute away from where their job is in an area they can't yet afford. These young people bring a youth culture to that area. They set up galleries and cafes, pop up record stores. They are poor, but they're cool. One group wanting to set up a mini pop up festival on the local green might meet another doing a trending podcast in their local independent pub during the open mic night and they see this woman who's amazingly talented and they give her a shot and they organize another show and the rising tide of all these small community collaborators lifts all boats and then people with money want to move there and then all the prices go up and the community cafe has to start selling avocado toast for a tenner to stay afloat money follows a creative community But see, the examples I gave there all fit in with what you think is creative. It's not actually true. Because it's the tech startups, the small business ventures at the seed funding stage, taking advantage of the low rents in the area and the industries that pop up around disposable income and young families that attract real money to an area. And these are not creative. I mean, it it feels like they shouldn't be creative, right? They They shouldn't be classed that way. And that's where you you hit this conflict at each extreme. People too focused on pure money have a slightly dismissive attitude to the value of creativity, just as those focused too much on pure creativity have a slightly dismissive attitude towards money. The problem is the stereotypes here of both the arts and of money. Firstly, money is just different things to different people. To some people, it's power. To some people, it's vanity. To some people, it's freedom. And to some people, it's security. But ultimately, it's the great unifying proxy to trade your trained time for something else and the stereotype of the arts is basically paintings plays poets and pop stars even architects and great designers are rarely considered true artists in the same way as they have some snooty sense of being a sellout if someone invested in them or they are collaborating with a capitalist company. Our current arts education unknowingly reinforces this quite ideological spiral because I guarantee you that those working in engineering or working away in computer programming practically single-handedly currently keeping the cultural industries economically relevant are in fact wildly more creative, fundamentally way more artistic than many of those who fall into the music, performing and visual arts sector. And that brings around another point. If money is to be diverted from the arts to STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, if someone who falls in the computer sciences category 
is considered in the creative industries, why not the engineer, the scientist or the mathematician? And that right there is where the whole idea of the arts and arts education completely collapses. And that's what I'm about to argue should happen. Yes, it's a pretty shocking statement to say that you should dissolve arts education, but that doesn't mean get rid of it. Far, far from it. As I think you need to dissolve it right into every other subject. And that everywhere else, it should actually multiply. Most people think that creativity comes under the creative arts umbrella, and it's a massive mistake. The amount of creativity in the field of STEM is utterly vast. And done right, it should be the same as art. But creative learning is getting squeezed. It's not yet in other subjects to thrive, like I hope it will be, and it's being pushed out within art. And if you're seeing the effects of funding cuts and less creative learning, and you still crave to explore them, there are more options out there than ever. And that brings me to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. If you actually do want to learn things like computer animation that make up the bulk of those creative industries, or user integration and design in the digital world, or even really traditional skills like acrylic painting, watercolors, technical drawing, or if you want to learn how to make videos like this one, their editing and filming courses. I've always been interested in 3D modeling, but I've not known how to get into it. So I've started a 3D modeling in Blender course that I'm gonna finish this summer, and I can do it totally at my own pace. In a world where creativity is getting attacked everywhere, why not explore a passion via Skillshare totally free for a whole month? Just use my link in the description and that's exactly what the first 500 people will get, a one month free trial of Skillshare. And I reckon that you should stick around as there are thousands of creative classes in countless categories, all taught by artists and experts leading in their field. Now, when I say that word, artist, what do you immediately think of? An artist has now come to mean many things to include a singer and an actor, but I would argue it should actually mean many more. But fundamentally, I think you would see them as a painter. Let's isolate and look at the subsection of core arts that I know best, which is fine art. Take the greatest painting in the world, The Wiser Beulah by Sam Hamper. Oh, sorry, I don't mean that one. Um, the world's most famous painting, The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. I would argue that Leonardo's greatest contribution to culture was not The Mona Lisa or The Last Supper. These are great. They are not pioneering. His anatomical sketches, including those of the skeleton, muscles and nervous system, were remarkably accurate for his time, considering he had nothing to go on. Now you can go and look it up online, but he literally had to dig it up against the law to slice bodies open and to work it out. He laid the groundwork for modern anatomical understanding. Da Vinci also drew moving water with amazing detail. These days, this doesn't seem like that amazing a feat, but in a world without photography, it's pretty incredible. And through those studies, he applied his observational understanding of water dynamics to various engineering projects, including the design of irrigation systems, water wheels, and canals. His direct insights into hydraulics and civil engineering contributed to better water management. And, and take Michelangelo, famous for the Sistine Chapel, he was commissioned by the ruling Medici family of Florence to design complex fortifications and advanced city walls to defend the city, and they were successful. In fact, the very idea of what they're both famous for, painting, back then, was purely technology. Depicting an image in time, transportable or fixed, for those who are unable to see it. I would argue that all of them would not be what we call artists today, but in fact be involved in STEM fields. They were technologists. Their personality type, born hundreds of years later, would have been working on the photo photographic camera for making images. And if born today, as much as it might pain your romantic artistic heart, do you really believe that they would pick up a paintbrush However, whatever they did do would be something creative. This word has become hijacked by its 
sister synonym, artistic. Let's just drive this home a little bit further. If you were born in the 1800s and considered yourself uncreative and wanted to be a doctor, you needed to learn how to draw to document anything like a growth, a deformity or a wound. Even doctors who treated the severed ear of a very famous artist in 1888, I think it was his left one, drew it. These days you'd look back at those and call them artists. Were they? When if that same person born today with the same temperament would just use scans and photography? The greatest artists of history have always been more than what that word has evolved to in the modern day. Today, an artist is decoupled from technology. The photography camera went one way, the impressionists went another way. And that's kind of the foundation of when art got tricky to teach. It became more personal, more expressive, a venture into a philosophical place to challenge concepts, ideas, performance art, conceptual art, abstract art. And there was another idea born, this romantic, idea of the starving, independent spirit, the broke, misunderstood genius. On the edge of sanity is the quintessential notion of the struggling artist, the man or woman who will refuse to sell out. And I would argue it's very unhelpful and it all evolved from that very man whose severed ear was drawn by that technical doctor in 1888. Now, people argue with me on this, but I feel this one man has come to dominate the artist's narrative the tortured artist, the unsung hero, the man who died without selling more than one cheap painting, remaining unknown, and is therefore immune to cultural criticism of how he handled a position of success or power, which is happening to Picasso and will happen to all successful artists who have success within their own time as they have to battle relevancy by the morality of their own, not only their own time, but all future times. And this one man gets a pass. And that one man obviously is Van Gogh, or Van Gogh, or Van Gogh, however you want to pronounce it. In England, we call him Van Gogh. And who was he? Well, in his own words, he said, what am I in the eyes of most people? A non-entity, an eccentric, someone who has no position in society and never will have. In short, the lowest of the low, often in the depths of misery, there is a still calmness and music inside me. I see paintings or drawings in the poorest cottages, the dirtiest corners, and my mind is driven towards these things with an irresistible momentum. I have nature and art and poetry, and if that is not enough, what is enough? It's beautiful. That man suffering tremendous mental illness on the brink of sanity, painting for the pure love of expression and to understand himself and the world around him is brimming with pure, unbridled artistry. And even just mentioning him, everything I've said up until now suddenly feels a bit icky, a bit brutal, too finance focused. For here we have what we have come to see as the epitome of the passionate, true artistic soul, for which at least some part must be taught and cultivated in our education system, right? My heart says it should. My head is not so sure. This ideal has unknowingly created the broke, starving artist stereotype, living off pure, uncorrupted passion for his vision alone, the purest, and it is not helpful, nor is it true? Van Gogh was indeed a genius, and it is a tragic tale, but he was not a broke, starving artist. He was fully funded through his life by his younger brother, Theo, and unlike the previous artists I mentioned, that funding continued when he had no success. If we all had a Theo who could support us in our careers with all the rent payments and art supplies we wished for, many more people would and could paint for the pure love of it without ever needing to sell anything. Even more handy for your legacy when that brother, once you die, happens to be an art dealer. Van Gogh never managed or needed to support himself, but he is one of my favourite artists and I'm thankful for Theo for bringing Van Gogh's work to the world. It deserves to be there. It is stunning, but his position should not be too artistically idealised in schools. I know a few people in my life who struggle with mental illness to the point where they can't fully function in society. And some of them 
have got the most beautiful sketchbooks that are just the most wonderful window into their world. Unfathomably stunning displays of their soul. They would never be cultivated and photographed or packaged for social media or a dealer as they are simply a very personal visual diary for when words become useless. There is no thought of comparison, of sharing, of art, of anything other than a grounding through a mark making meditation. They, I would argue just like Van Gogh, wouldn't be able to handle public success in their lifetime. It would be like their guts were strewn across the floor and up the walls. Yet they are true artists by my definition. Contemporary art has forced me to find my own personal definition of an artist. Because, well, at least in drama, you can tell if someone can act or you can tell if someone can sing or play an instrument. If you walk into a gallery and you don't get it, you're told you're just wrong, but you're not. You know. And because art has become so watered down now and been invaded by philosophy or social commentary or good politics or identity, it's now considered more exclusive and more elitist than any other art form. I really like the ancient Greek definition of the word art, which was something like tashin. And I think it's much closer to mastery if you were to define it as a definition now, because the word art is a bit meh. In a world where anything can be art and anyone can be an artist, it's kind of meaningless. Tashin, or I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, was seen and described in lots of fields, from geometry and politics and music to shipbuilding to generalship and painting. But it was only reserved for the very, very best examples. Painters and sculptors were painters and sculptors, but only the very best were Tashin. Doesn't that just feel like a better definition? Sadly, Van Gogh, like so many great Tashins, was before his time. My heart says you must teach him and his genius in school somewhere. But equally, he had no position in society. He was the lowest of the low. And state-funded educators have to be careful as some creative people who study him in school may find themselves thinking that any compromise on the slightest part of their artistic integrity is selling out and that there is an honour in being a broke artist and a glory to it. And that was me. And they, like me, will come to a hard lesson that unless you have a Theo, there is not. And in the modern day, the only people who can now fill this successful individual artist trope are those who are heavily supported. The wealthy who don't have to sacrifice weeks to the modern equivalent of contemplating light on wheat in a field because they have to work for their bread. It's not just in my world of art and painting where you need to have a wealthy patron to survive. Currently, only the most wealthy actors from the best private schools are making it in Hollywood, and I don't think there's been a working class band in the charts for a decade. And still, state schools, whether consciously or unconsciously, encourage musicians, artists and actors under this guise that they could do it too. My teachers used to hold up Tracy Emin and Damien Hirst as working class artists who made it, but it's bullshit. They only made it because of the support of the the same agency that got Thatcher into power and destroyed the working class party that their peers voted for, to be poster childs for the Conservative Party, to pretend that they did support the arts of the poor because they made a handful of them millionaires. But I'm not saying that to rile anyone up. I'm simply saying that state schools should stop trying to support someone who wants to be in a career as an individual artist unless they can prove that they can do it. And it's not working. This idea of standalone arts education doesn't work as there is no standalone artists. Think of those singers and artists that you admire who are pasted across billboards to sell their shows. They have found their way through a myriad of people, many of whom are equally creative, be that their promoters, their peer group, their publicist, and the glorification of the individual talent in art, in literature, in music, is often a brilliant story and a beautiful lie. The greatest moments of acting that you've seen on screen, that you often attribute to a singular human performer, is more often than you realise the result, in fact, of timing and selection by a brilliant editor. The guidance of a visionary 
director, underpinned by a solid scriptwriter, with the performance held in the moment by a crew that made a fantastic set and lighting, with a stunning score by a supreme musician, a whole set of hundreds of equally, if not more talented creative people who make up the vast, vast majority of the individual artist, the real creative industries. If the arts is to demand more funding at every level, it needs to see and acknowledge this collective better, not just within its own sector, but across all academic subjects. The isolating of arts into this heady category of something other, something greater, is really unhelpful. There is true artistry in physics, in engineering, in making 400 tonnes of metal fly 400 people across the world, in chemistry, in research, in coding, plus funding is not free. I don't mean you have to pay for it in taxes, I mean it has a weakness in that it often has a bias about who it supports. It's not about the best art, it's often about who has the best story about why they made the art. Funding for select communities has to justify it to be seen to be helping those who are, say, marginalised. The operas and the orchestras, the things often only engaged by the top of the upper classes, also don't get the same level of cuts. It's hard to know if what's put in front of you via funding got there by box ticking or artistic merit. Funding often muddies art more than people realise. And this adds up to why, as I explained earlier, the majority of creative people who are really making it in the creative services didn't study an arts degree. The romantic notions around art are so unhelpful. Never sell out or use your creativity for a company. Well, Michelangelo and da Vinci's greatest works of art were all commissions by the leading powers of their time, and the only reason Van Gogh didn't need to sell out was he was supported by his brother. There is this idealistic, unrealistic notion of success via art alone, and it's damaging to those good at art, and it makes those who are bad at art feel like they are uncreative. If you study physics or biology and think you are not artistic just because you were bad at these modern bullshit art classes, then you are totally deluding yourselves. The most calculating mathematician and logic-driven physician without any sensitivity to the arts still came into their field through pure creativity. We all did, through play and performance as little children. Isaac Newton, as a boy, made these lovely, pretty toy windmills. And it was the visual beauty of geometry that first drew him into trying to understand such forms through mathematics. All these modern tropes of artistic temperaments versus academic or scientific temperaments are bullshit. They're modern inventions. And they're flawed. Imagine you got a school report for your daughter. Let's call her Sarah. And the report says, Sarah is forgetful and a daydreamer. She also doesn't excel well in subjects that require rote memorisation. Sarah has a a tendency to rebel against authority. However, she thrives in creative learning environments where questions are welcomed. You'd think, well, my little Sarah might well struggle in a purely mathematical or scientific field, but it sounds like she has a slightly artistic heart. She'd find her way in the creative industries. And that report is real, but it's not Sarah's. I just changed the name. It's actually of a nine-year-old little boy called Albert. And yes, I mean that, Albert. And by the time he was 12, Einstein had become exceptional at maths. But you can't tell me that this description you just heard isn't that of an unharnessed creative energy of a child who would naturally lean into the arts in a modern curriculum, not to science. What was taught as technology 200 years ago is now often taught within fine art today. And the whole of the contemporary art sector kind of only survives because it's being drip-fed by modern philosophy or it's become a vessel for activism or to voice social grievances. Art doesn't really know what it is. And yes, education is very, very slow to change. I don't think many people realise just how Victorian so many of the fundamental elements of our education system are. 
Just as a side, the long summer holiday of six weeks is proven to negatively affect children's education as they regress in that time and parents have to bend over backwards as they have to keep working. All studies show that it would be more beneficial to cut it by three weeks and then just add those three weeks evenly across the winter, spring and autumn holidays. So why is it there? Well, it's a relic of when children all went home to help their families with the harvest. How many kids do you know helping with the harvest today? And how about the length of the school day? In state education, it's two hours shorter than the work day. And while many people think it's too long, many kids used to go back and work for families and communities after this. In independent schools, private schools, where resources are plentiful, that's when homework is done, that's when music lessons happen, that's when dance classes or rehearsals for the school play are undertaken, sports team practices and art lessons. State education can't afford this. And if art deserves to be in the curriculum, it needs to be understood fully why it was put there in the first place and we need to articulate how it is still serving us now. And I think a good way to do this is to compare it to another subject that isn't seen as academic. And that is sport. Now, the tangible idea for why we study sport in schools is more obvious. Obviously, sport is good for kids. They have to move their bodies. They need a physical education. But I don't think people really understand what the main benefit from sport is. And that's how to work in a team. I would argue more so than any other subject, as the competitive element really hits home how effective your teamwork is. And I, I truly believe that if you take someone who had a really good sports education and learn how to be very good in a team, not the talented but ball-hogging goal scorer, but the person who helped link up play, knew where they were good and where others were better, if you put them into a big company as an adult, they would actually perform much better than an academically way more qualified peer who didn't know how to work in a team. I also don't know about you, but I've noticed a correlation between people who are really into individual sports at school or not into sport at all, and those who moan more about their boss. But I have no evidence for this. It's just a, a, an anecdotal thing I've noticed, but think about it. So back to schools. They teach you academic stuff, but they also teach you art and sports because they help with body and mind and it's part of that holistic education. Except I think most people have forgotten the mind bit. And that's where my heart is drawn back to Van Gogh, who, if he had any legacy that should be highlighted in schools, it's that he truly believed that art had the power to heal and console. He saw it as a way to connect with the human experience to offer comfort and solace in times of difficulty and pain. And I have to say, the rise of anxiety and mental health issues among young people and the increasing lack of engagement with art for themselves doesn't feel like a coincidence. Not art to share, not art to be graded, art for themselves. Making art to me is the greatest form of meditation. And this is where I hit a conflict. As I have the same, in a way, with sport, as that many kids who were bad at it were totally put off doing it for themselves and their own physical health just because they couldn't run the cross-country times like the other kids shouldn't put them off running if they like it, but it does. Both have other benefits that are less obvious. With sport, it's teamwork and the life lesson of losing, the collective joy of winning and the benefit of better physical health. With art, it's inner work, the life lesson of listening and looking and then manifesting ideas by making the joy of creation for a better mental health. Everyone should benefit from both in schools, even if most of us don't go into either as a profession. But let's talk about those professions for a minute. We all remember the kids who were good at sport in school. Now, as near impossible as it is to get into professional sports, there does exist a sports world. There was always a correlation. Mate, you could play for England one day, or she's gonna make the Olympics. Oh, I bet he makes county. Whether or not they choose to pursue it, you know they could have. They could have gone on to make a living, as honed and trained talent in sport does shine through. You also knew those kids who were really good at art at school. But if you look at the art world, 
it isn't clear that they could make it. The correlation between their artistic talent that you know they had in school and those who succeed in the modern art world or acting world or music world do not necessarily correlate. And it's exactly why I didn't go on to study art, but I continue to enjoy the benefits of it by doing it every single day. I've even got blue paint on my hand now. I had lovely art teachers at school and I loved drawing and painting. I didn't really like writing. I barely wrote in my sketchbooks and so I actually barely scraped by. And some of my peers in my class wrote ideas and stuck bits of paper into their sketchbooks without ever picking up a pencil and got better grades for it. I became totally disillusioned. In fact, I would say that throughout my education, the two most artistically creative projects I was involved in didn't happen within the walls of an art department. They were in history class when I was 11 and in maths class when I was 15. To this day, the only reason I remember anything about the Anglo-Saxons is I did a big illustrated book in year seven about castles. It included pop-out models and cartoon strips about how they would work. Ikea mimicked instructions of how they would be built. I loved it. I even adapted my Warhammer models that I collected at the time to be Anglo-Saxon warriors and took Polaroids of them in vital positions. And it got me thinking about battle strategy in ways that I would never have done if I just had to do an essay this very beautiful physical product. But the one that was key to me going on to study engineering is the one I had at 15, where my maths teacher, Mr. Donovan, was trying to get us to learn about quadratic sequences. I was totally lost. But this teacher just said, we're gonna try and see how each number relates to each other, go. And I just sat there, what do you mean go? And then he came round and asked what I was doing and I said, I have no idea, but I'm good at associating colours together and maybe I could do it with numbers as colours. I laughed and he said, brilliant, try it. So I thought, okay, and a little spark of enthusiasm came. So I was like, okay, well, let's say that N is what you're going to add to these numbers and it's got to be the same. So let's make N blue and see how it affects all these other different colours. Now this goes completely wrong, totally flawed with 10 seconds of thinking, but it got me thinking. He let me try something that he knew was wrong. He let me fail, and in doing so, he just sparked my curiosity. Maths is pure problem solving. The creativity that might express an emotion through something artistically isn't that different to the creativity that might solve an equation. I believe it's simply how you were taught early on to access it. On our first days at school, every topic is understood through play through drawing and tools and singing and rhyming, but we grow up. The question is, how fast? By secondary school, I think it's fair to say that most of these elements of learning through play have been left behind, except in art classes. But hopefully you've been left suitably inspired. And I think that the arts get sectioned off into its own subject too soon. Now, yes, I understand the pressures of primary school teaching and kindergartens for you over the pond, that the mess and madness of art when you have 30 children to engage is near impossible. When you have metrics to hit and targets that must be measurable, how inspired into a subject a child is via an artistic element is a long-term investment. Kids should leave secondary school being able to read and write and do basic maths, yes. But more important, kids should leave inspired to learn and engage with the education system. Both are now a huge problem, and I think including more arts is the solution to both. Now, I need to admit one thing that is done very, very well by arts education in schools as it stands that is so often completely misunderstood. By that third category of people we looked at at the beginning, those who think that the cuts make sense. Students in rural and low-income regions are disproportionately affected by budget cuts that prioritise tested subjects such as maths and science. You would think that these kids, metaphorically at the coalface, are the ones who should be pri prioritising an education for industry with little time for airy fairy arts. However, research that I'll put below shows that at-risk youth from lower socioeconomic strata demonstrate increased engagement with academic opportunities in correlation with greater exposure to arts education. The wealthier, younger kids who don't engage with the arts don't have this trend. So why is this? The reason people are surprised 
when they see lower socioeconomic kids fall away from maths and science when the arts are taken away is because people do not see how it is the natural starting point of each of those subjects. Art, drama and music has always been the perfect Trojan horse to inspire kids to access more academic subjects. You sing the alphabet to understand it, you dress up and role play as Romans, you do maths through coloured object play, learning about light, geometry, form through drawing. That's why the arts were there in the first place. And we are now entering a time when adaptability and creativity are vital across all areas of the workforce. And also in the midst of a time when young people are feeling more lost and nihilistic than ever before. If education must give the skills to help the society and the self, a school system sympathetic to that what can be taught through the vessel of art will be the strongest and most future-proof system. It has wrongly been sectioned off as something separate, and so it's been easy to sever off in a round of funding cuts, whereas if it was fully integrated, it would be impossible to cut and the benefit would also be more obvious. Now I'm not saying that advanced algebra would benefit by an assessment of integers by interpretive dance, but the developmental route in education from first understanding numbers to enthusing students into something like advanced maths includes a lot more creative learning in its foundation than people are willing to give credit for. People need to understand creativity better, that it isn't a trait limited to the art department and that in order to save the arts you need to strip it of this exclusive badge of creativity and sew it into every other subject. That way you produce the world's best artists, the best Tashians in every field.